attention, but it is the first time we see it today, so I'm excited to see it. Yeah, at least we didn't get fortified motherload. That would have been, uh, <laughs> that would have been pretty ridiculous. Fortified <laughs> yes. and bolstering in this dungeon is a huge pain. Fortunately, it's just tyrannical, not just fortified. Yeah, we saw a method you used right through, as Jack mentioned earlier, they actually threaded through all the way to this roundabout, as he calls it, and pulled the Thax here. Now, the Thax do have a lot of HP, so they need to be careful with the bolstering here. They also have a random charge and a random player that does get increased by, of course, bolstering and the enrage effect they are casting, so they need to be careful here. Yeah, it's actually a super dangerous pull with four adult thugs. If, if two or three of them all enrage charge one player, they'll die, but I think they have a focus where they, where they focus the furthest player away, so you can kind of bait them a little bit. But, it, you know, at the same time, they deal with it Quickly enough, it's not that that big of a deal. We also saw Team Paluka go even further into the dungeon for the first pull. They ended up starting one of the bots off and just moving on further into the dungeon than Method EU did. Okay, so one interesting uh, thing to see here, Method EU, they actually sapped the met, uh, the jockey and then did this pull. So they might actually try to pull a bunch of jockeys together, make them go into their construct and pull them all together so they don't have the HP discrepancy in one pull. Yeah, absolutely. As well, when when you when you do that, CC, you're allowing you to kill the rest of the mobs without bolstering the mob due to the range away from the, the mob that you see seed. So also just smart mob manipulation. They might be trying to get multiple bots at the same time, S similar to what Team Faluka is doing right now. They have three mechanized peacekeepers in their pack right now, which is a huge pull since each peacekeeper gives about four and a half percent. That's what we're gonna see teams do in this first part of the dungeon. They're gonna be trying to pull as many peacekeepers as possible to get the percentage as high as possible, and then they're gonna move on to the rest of the dungeon. Yeah, now we see a peace, uh, peacekeeper pull coming in from Method U as well. Now they do have a bunch of uh, smaller mobs, as we see the vendors and the assassins as well. Now they need to be very careful here to not kill them too uh, too fast, else of course those peacekeepers get buffed by the bolstering. Not only do they do more HP if they get buffed, but they also gain more HP. And we see Mirrors dying here, but the battle rest coming out immediately. Yes, unfortunately. Using a battle res this early in the dungeon, just on trash like this, is pretty unfortunate. Now, the, the, the mobs that they are pulling in addition to the Peacekeeper are pretty difficult to deal with. Fortunately, since they have rogues, all they have to do is have a rogue on each one to interrupt and then cheap shot the stun, and then they can deal with it on their own. And they have so much backup in the form of the Druid knock, as well as the Monk just... It's a free, free AoE stun plus a free AoE knock with Ring of Peace, so they're super safe with their pulls. They're no, they know what they can do. Very good stuff. But they actually did uh, kill the smaller mobs a little bit too early. We see the peacekeepers are still on like 30-ish percent HP once they died. Now this bolstering is going to cost them a lot of time. Uh, as we said earlier, Metalog is very difficult to deal with because of those peacekeepers just having so much HP. Yeah, I mean, it, it could have been a lot worse, right? They, they bolstered it maybe like 20, 25%. Yeah. If they bolstered it 50%, it would have been... I mean, we would have been here for the next minute and a half <laughs> talking about how they messed up. Kuluka's moving on to the... Well, they're on the right side of the dungeon here, and they also propped their first reaping mob, so they're doing another huge pull. We saw them do this in Freehold as well, where the Ellie Shaman actually did almost quite get up in, into unholy DK damage territory, but not quite. In addition to that, you have to also mention the earthquakes in this first part of the dungeon, especially with the amount of casters there are. You get a lot of caster reaping mobs, so that earthquake knocking down the caster reaping mobs is also just so useful in this dungeon especially for their group comp. Definitely. Now we see, of course, uh, Team Paluka is ahead in trash. They are on 30%, while a Method U just propped their weeping wave, so uh, they are on 23%, and they're down one battle rest. So we see Team Paluka here uh, a little bit ahead. Now we're going to see them do a lot of trash here, most likely, until we see the first boss. Usually, like depending on your strat, you can go up to like 70% trash before we even pull a boss at all. Right, and there are some teams that will do it based around bloodlust timings, right? They'll get about 50, 55%, do the first boss, then go back and pull more trash before moving on to the rest of the dungeon. We'll have to see what they're doing here because this is like a lower level key compared to what live dungeons are. Generally speaking, if they do if they do still have Bloodlust off cooldown before they get to the first boss, we might see them go past the first boss and pull more trash, then come back. But obviously they have to get through this part of the dungeon first. Yeah, so it is tyrannical. Of course, the bosses do have a lot of HP, especially in Metalot. There is some bosses who just take a long time, uh, especially the last two bosses take a long time. Now the first boss, uh, of course, gives you uh, does have a damage uh, increase on him, so it's gonna t it's gonna be a little bit easier to kill this boss. But tyrannical on top of like the trash taking longer because of the bolstering, so we're probably going to see a pretty high time in this dungeon overall. Yeah, and one of the things that we always mentioned about monks in the past, especially in the last MDI, is they have very big burst windows for their cooldowns. They can have an SEF up for both of the damage phases as well as a touch death up for, for the damage phase, so I think that the boss damage, especially for the first boss anyways, is a little bit more in, in favor of Team Method EU. But outside of that, I think the Ellie Shaman's definitely a lot better for the second boss. 
I think so as well. Now we see here they're pulling some more trash here on Method EU side. Uh, we didn't really talk about the assassins yet. Now the assassins they do have one cast, a poison cast that needs to be interrupted because if you do not interrupt that cast, they will actually put poison on their blades, and then every uh, auto attack will put a poison debuff on the tank. And when they do their fan of knives, they will apply the poison debuff on all the, on the whole group. So it's very uh, crucial to interrupt that ability as well. Right, and that's that's where the, the utility of the rogues come in. They can deal with both the interrupt and the stun on their own. And as well as that, like we mentioned earlier, there's so much backup CC in the group comp that they generally aren't too... They could probably pull three or four assassins at the same time and they'd be fine. Yeah, rogues are very good control. They can just take one mob, even if, it's, uh, if it does have a lot of casts, you can just interrupt one, you can stun the other, you can uh, step one or something like that. They just have insane control on rogues so they can deal with all those casters very well. As yeah, I mentioned it earlier, the most dangerous mob in the first part of the dungeon is absolutely the refreshment vendor, right? Especially on bolstering. So if you start bolstering up that refreshment vendor, its channel ability on people is probably going to two or three shot them with two ticks. So you see that refreshment vendor, the X marker, that's the mob they need to kill right now. Yeah, so it does have the cast that targets a random player, as Sour said earlier. Uh, if the cast actually channels all the way through, you get stunned. But I don't think that's the, your biggest concern because the channel by itself already does so much damage that you have to interrupt it just because of that. If, you, if the stun goes off, it is dispellable, but if it goes on the healer, of course, no one can dispel a magic debuff on the healer, so you're in trouble. So once again, we just see them pulling more and more trash in this dungeon, and it's more of the same trash we've already mentioned. Both sides have slightly diff differing trash bags. The right side has a lot of mech jockeys and adult thugs. The left side has more caster mobs. Moving towards the right side, all of the mech jockeys on the side, they're going to try to get as many mech jockeys into the peacekeepers as possible. So whenever you pull a mech jockey, it runs towards the nearest robot and tries to jump into it. If you stun it, or in any other ways you see it, it won't jump in. Now, unfortunately, you can't get two mech jockeys to some to jump into the same robot, but there are enough robots around the room where you can get probably four or five of them on this side of the room to get a whole bunch of trash percentage. Yeah, so the jockeys will jump to their closest peacekeeper, right? So what some people do is they uh, try to, once they pull the jockeys, they try to get them somehow apart so they will actually uh, go in a different uh, peacekeeper instead of both going to the same one. But which usually it was a, a strat that you went for when he had a DK because they could just grip them. But now, of course, we don't have grips anymore as we see all those broad wars. Right, and do we do see P Team Paluka kind of moving up towards that boss area? We're not sure if we're going to go into that boss room yet. They do st still do have three and a half minutes left on their bloodlust cooldown. So, not quite sure if they don't know what they're doing. They're definitely CCing up. They're hard CCing up moms right now. Yeah, yeah I do, uh, I've seen two saps come out from them now. Sap is so important for bolstering because it uh, keeps the mobs actually out of combat. Like, it's a true CC, as we mentioned er in an earlier dungeon. So, if you sap a mob, they're not actually in combat. And if you kill um, if you kill mobs close to them, they will not be bolstered because you didn't engage combat with them. Now, if you use another CC, uh, something like Inca from the Windwalker, that is not as true to see and if you incap them and you kill mobs close to them they will be bolstered so the double step coming out of both groups is actually very important here for the bolstering yeah, and once again another huge pull coming out from them all of the reaping into two into three more mechanized peacekeepers this is going to be just probably the last of their mob percentage i think they'll get in this first part of the dungeon this will put them at about 75 percent if they pull it off clean once again the earthquake knocking down all these grave bolts casts so useful interrupting ice spritzer they're just super clean so far yeah, on top of the two rogues having so much interrupts, they also have the Lamento Shaman. Uh, they, their comp just works out really well, especially for this very first part of the dungeon. Now, we see the percentage uh, of trash. Now, Method EU actually caught up quite a bit in percentage. They're in 69% uh, now, while Team Paluka is on 63. So I would say they're pretty even now. Both teams did use their battle rest. Both teams had one death. And both teams have around two to three minutes on their bloodlust. As you said, they're probably going to wait until it's ready, kill more trash, and then go to the boss. Well, the other thing to mention is, right, you don't have to use your bloodlust right on the right on the pull of the boss. You kind of want to use it maybe 30 seconds in when the first damage amp phase is. I suppose you could pull the boss and use bloodlust on the second damage amp phase, but that's just so inefficient with the cooldowns. I don't really foresee them doing it. They're probably going to go past the boss and pull more trash, or stay here and pull more trash. Yeah. But it's interesting to see what you know what the differing things are, they are doing. Because right now they're doing pretty much the exact same thing. They're going around this circular area and just pulling pretty much everything in sight while trying to get as many peacekeepers as possible. Yeah, of course, they, they do have a different route, but they are pulling the same mobs. They have different routes of so seeing certain mobs, pulling the other mobs. Of course, uh, they both have to consider the bolstering. And the more you bolster mobs, the more time you're going to lose, the more inefficient your pull is going to be. 
and if you bolster one mob way too high and it's going to take too long to heal, you might even have to wipe or of course they are a night elf so they can shadow mob in case something goes wrong. But with the, um, the bosses of course, you can't pull any of the mobs on top of the bosses because of the affixes. We've seen a lot before that people would uh, pull mobs on top or while the boss fight was going on they would uh, have the healer pull some more trash. But because of the bolstering affix, they of course can't do that, they don't want to bolster the boss. Yeah, and we also see maybe 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 a sign of like not quite being practiced. Only pulling the three mobs, generally speaking, in, in speedrunning terms is pretty bad. It's really it's really inefficient. I would have liked to see maybe with a more practice team pull mobs into that pack. But once again, like we mentioned earlier, these teams probably don't have as much practice as they had on the first three dungeons they played. So they just kind of you know maybe forgot and ran up and like, oh, we have to we have to pull these to pull the boss. <laughs> yeah. So now we're already 10 minutes into the dungeon. Neither uh, one of those groups uh, pulled the boss. As we mentioned earlier, just a trash later on in this dungeon is so much more difficult to deal with. And I assume none of these teams really uh, practice those later pulls because uh, they just have so many deadly mechanics. Even if bolstering is uh, hard on this very first trash, they are still just opting to pull this trash instead of the later one because it's so hard to deal with. And we do see Method EU doing exactly what I was mentioning doing. They're pulling Reaping into this 3 pull, so just definitely being a lot more efficient, as well as being higher on mob count. Actually, with this 3-pack, they're going to be at about like 95% mob count before they kill the first <laughs> boss. So they're not planning on doing anything for the rest of Dungeon until they kill the last boss, which yeah. is pretty crazy. So we're probably going to see a lot of Shadow Melt skips later. Now, that, that's the beauty of Shadow Melt here, because there's a lot of uh, a lot of skips you can't really do with Shroud, because there's a lot of mobs who have True Sight, who are stealth detection, so you can't use your Shroud to go past unless you wait and you have like very sneaky ways. So it is better to just use your Shadow Melt and do all those death skips, quote unquote, with your Shadow Melt instead. There we go, 93% going into the first boss with their Bloodless coming off cooldown in 20 seconds, which is going to be just in time for the first damage amp phase. So, the coin-operated crowd pummel. It's a few different mechanics. Number one, the static pulse you're seeing right now knocks everyone back, does pretty significant damage. Every now and then it'll shoot out three bombs. Every s when you kick the bomb into the boss, it'll put a damage-taken debuff onto the boss, which stacks, and it also refreshes the timer. So, ideally, you're gonna kick two bombs into the boss, wait a few seconds, kick the third bomb, get the 150% damage buff, and then pop Bloodlust and go in. Yeah, that's exactly what Method you did here. Now, Team Poluka also pulled their boss, they also popped their bloodlust, so they had the same idea. Now, we see one more thing here, there's, there's coin pulls on the floor. Now, it's some, sometimes they will, uh, the boss will cast an ability coin magnet and will actually pull all the coins that are nearby towards him, and he will, uh, it will increase his damage then. So the tank needs to make sure that they're that the boss is far away from them. It looks like I'm eating my words. The Ellie Shaman's actually outbursting <laughs> yeah. everyone else in the group right now, which is pretty impressive. Lots of damage coming up from the Ellie Shaman. When you, when you think about it, this boss is really cyclical, right? It's kind of the same thing. Static pulse, bombs, coin magnet, and it just kind of repeats over and over again. It's, it's a single target encounter, so all you gotta do is DPS just this one boss. Make sure you're dealing with the bomb debuffs correctly. Now, if you do mess up the bombs, they explode and put the damage taken debuff on your group, which makes it really difficult to live through the static shock ability because it can start one-shotting you at that point. Definitely. We see the Static Shock coming through and do a lot of damage uh, on the whole group. Now, the last ability we didn't mention yet is the Frontal Cleave to the boss does. It, uh, he always does it in the tank's direction, but it has, it's a really big cone and it goes uh, further apart in the back. So sometimes when the tank is kiting the boss around because of the coin magnet, the boss might be facing towards the middle. So the healer especially has to be careful that he's not getting hit by that ability while he's throwing the bombs back onto the boss. Yeah, so we need to mention what's going to happen in a later dungeon as they get this last few percentage down. This boss is about dead. Team Poluka is about 11% trash percentage behind, so we're going to have to see what they plan on pulling to make that up, because they don't plan on doing anything after the second boss, I can guarantee you that. The only trash they'll probably end up, end up doing is maybe one or two mobs after the last boss. So here we go, they're pulling a whole p a lot of these mine rats plus earth shapers. These are very dangerous mobs. Yeah, these mobs are so dangerous because not only do we have bolstering, but even without bolstering, they're already very dangerous. They do shoot um, uh, the tank all the time, and at some point the tank will just run out of defenses and he will have to kite them, and then they will start shooting random players or melee, get aggro, and so on. So this is a very p difficult pull to do. That's why we saw them actually CCing and sapping some of the mobs here. They're CCing all of the dangerous mobs, the yeah. Earth Shapers, which will, like you said, shoot rocks at everyone in the group and potentially one-shot them with bolstering stacks. We see what's that, two what's that, distracts as well as two saps going out, and then they're pulling it all together. The reason the reason for that specifically is because the mine rats have about, what, a third of the HP of these mobs, so it's kind of impossible to avoid bolstering with these mobs if you pull them with. So separating up the pull, very clean, using their CC in the group, like what I see. 
Yeah, it's uh, actually good to see that they do have a strategy. They're not just coming in and saying, oh, we're just going to play whatever, as we said before. So they did actually, both of those teams did practice this dungeon, as we see some very control pulls coming in, the steps coming out, making sure that they don't pull uh, mobs that have different kinds of HP. So very good uh, stuff coming out from Team Poluka here and Method EU, with 100% trash now, by the way. Yeah, they did proc their last Reaping Wave instead of waiting until the end of the dungeon, so that might be a little bit of a time loss. But at the end of the day, they're done with their trash. Now they're just going to go boss, boss, boss in the dungeon. And that's going to be fun. Definitely. Now, of course, as I said earlier, Tyrannical in this dungeon, the last two bus, uh, the last three bosses actually uh, last quite a while, even if it's uh, level 18. Um, and especially this boss is kind of difficult to deal with if you only have melee players, because those mobs, those earth shapers, actually fixate on a random target, and if they manage to melee hit you, they will stack up a bleed on you, which does a lot of damage, especially on Tyrannical. So they will probably try to kite the boss in a circle while the melee is trying to not get hit by those earth shakers. Yeah, playing melee on this boss is pretty miserable because you're being t you're being fixated by each of these earth ragers, but you can't DPS your own earth rager down. So you're kind of hoping your team is going to help you out. But the problem is, at the same time, they're also all getting fixated by earth ragers. So it's, it's just kind of a concerted effort to kite around in circles. At the same time, the boss is uh, occasionally doing this tectonic smash. It's a fr large frontal cone, so it makes your kiting a lot more difficult, too. In addition to that, he also occasionally empowers the Earth Raiders, meaning making them do a lot of AOE damage, and you have to stun them to stop them from doing that. So we see Team Poluka now also being on the bus there, uh, approximately 40% HP ahead met on Method EU side. Now, at this point, it's just going to be whoever has the most damage on bosses, of course, because we only have bosses left. There's no more trash to do except uh, one small mod for Team Poluka at the very end. They will skip the reaping most likely. And we also have skips coming through, though. Now, skips usually uh, are safe if you have played uh, accordingly, but if you do something wrong while trying to do a skip uh, with Shadow Mel, maybe someone presses it too early, someone presses it too late, there might be uh, a wipe coming through, which will cost them a lot of time. Yeah, typically the safest thing to do in this dungeon is to use a pre-battle race, which is the only class that can do that is at a Warlock. You throw a Soul Stone on your healer and then everyone just runs through, and if you mess up, healer takes the Soul Stone and you're good. But unfortunately, Warlock not being used in this dungeon, so their safest bet is to run through probably all the way to the end of the third boss's platform, pop Shadow Mode so that everything resets, they drop aggro, and they move into the boss. And since Shadow Mode's only a three-minute cooldown, they can do that for both the third boss and the last boss. Yes, definitely. Now, we want, uh, we do have one save Haven for Team Paluka because they do have the Shaman, which has Ankh. So in case something goes wrong and they'll uh, end up dying, we can have the Shaman Ankh rest the healer and the, the healer can master as everyone else. Now we see um, the boss dying for Method EU. They're going to uh, probably run through and Shadow Melt, as we mentioned before, and hopefully nothing goes wrong. Yeah, this death run is a little bit spooky because there's a lot of mobs in here that have true sight, so you can't really shroud through this very efficiently. There is a path that you can do it, but it requires correct mob pathing, and if you, you can't sit here and wait in a time in a timed event like this, you just have to go. So probably what we're going to see is the tank going forward, getting aggro and everything, and then everyone running through after him so that they don't get targeted by abilities, which we see here. Yeah, the most important thing here is Saelia getting out of combat and being safe because he's the person with the master. So we see Saelia actually being in stealth, popping his dash, going as far away as possible, and uh, propping the shadow melt here. Now we see there was an unfortunate quaking coming through, but they did manage to reset all the mobs. Now he's just going to heal up the group, and then they're going to engage this boss here. All right, so the third boss, Rixa, flux flame. <laughs> Interesting game. Beautiful name. Once again, another like the bosses in this dungeon are pretty cyclical. Their 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 mechanics are pretty much done in a cycle. So typically, what this boss will do is it'll put two pu it'll focus players, put two puddles on the ground, and then after it puts the two puddles on the ground, it'll also try to wipe the platform by blowing them away. Unfortunately, blowing the players away also blows the void zones on the ground away. Yeah, so there's an additional mechanic which uh, applies two debuffs to the two closest targets. Usually it will be the tank and probably a rogue taking them because uh, it does do a lot of damage, especially on Tyrannical, and it's a magic debuff, so you, uh, the healer can only dispel one. So what they usually try to do is have either the tank and the ro rogue take it at the, same t at the same time while the rogue will cloak it and the healer dispel the tank, or uh, you have another rotation with defensive cooldown, so whichever person is not getting dispelled needs to have an defensive up. Right, and uh, we do see Fushu going down on the right side, unfortunately, while they're doing the skip here. I'm not really sure how they're going to get him. A click going down two, really unfortunate for them. So what we what you were mentioning about the uh, the defensives, also something that they have they have on their side with the monk that they don't have on the side with the Ellie Shaman is that they can actually karma the debuff too, which is a free extra damage increase for the monk. And we see the monk topping the meters right now. Yeah. So 
definitely an improvement for them. They do get everyone rezzed up on the side of Team Poluca. Fortunately, they were all in range there, so it's not too big of a deal, but that is an extra 10 seconds on the board for that team. Yeah, we just see Method U getting further and further ahead, and we have to mention again just the Windwalker Monk ap applying this 5% physical debuff for everyone else in the group. So if you look at the damage meters, you're not only comparing the Monk's damage to the Elemental Shaman's damage, but you also have to keep in mind that the Monk increases everyone else's damage on top of that. Right, that physical damage debuff, debuff is no joke, and they're the only ones that take it, so there's no scrolls there, unfortunately. Now, we do see Rings of Flux Flame, Flux Flame getting really, really low from Method EU. Unfortunately, Poluca is almost 60% behind here as we see the cooldowns coming back up for Method EU. Yeah, so Method EU does have 100% trash, so after this boss dies, all they have to do is uh, somehow skip the trash through the last boss and engage it. Now, they can either shroud uh, this path, and as we mentioned before, there's also a way to shroud it without getting combat if there's a certain path from the true side mobs, um, which they're actually doing here. I think they have a really good timing because sometimes you might have to wait the bottom until you have a good position of the true side mobs, but they either have a very good timing or they just said, you know what, we're just gonna go. Yeah, I believe it depends on the path of the two war machines, right? Yeah. They did get the good timing and they are able to shroud past. And even if they weren't able to shroud past, they could have taken the back route because it looks like their shadow melds are off cooldown here. Exactly. So they're all going to pop them. It was just a little bit of a safe thing. They were able to get half, two thirds of the way up without having to, you know, get in combat with anything. As they f get to the final boss of the dungeon, Mogul Rezdunk. Yeah, so one thing that I really like to see here is that they already had the world markers put up there. So they're probably before they ran into this dungeon, they did a mythic zero or something, uh, put their, their markers up and now they already have them once they reach the boss. The markers are important to call out the safe space because uh, there's those boombas that are flying around the room. They will change positions and after a while they will shoot out missiles in a straight line in front of them. So you'll always have to pay attention where they're flying to and you will have different safe spots every time. And Mughal is all about area of the Nile. Every single mechanic the boss does is an area of the Nile. So you see the Scatling gun ability where the boss will spin in a circle. And if you get hit by the Gatling gun, you take ticking damage, which in this tyrannical setting is a lot of damage. In addition to that, like you said, the bots will fly to different spots in the area and apply a vertical and a horizontal line of rockets in a 2x3 grid. Not a 3x3 grid, as some people think. It's 2x3. <laughs> we can see them flying around here. Yeah. One bot on the bottom right, one flying toward through the middle of the screen. And they're going to apply a line of rockets based off of where they're facing. You can see them do it right now. When this happens at the same time as Gatling gun, there's, there's not that much room coming out, in addition to the quaking also going out. So these guys have to be very, very efficient with where they're standing, making sure they're, t they're spread out, but not too spread out, so that when the rocket goes out, they don't also take more AoE damage. Yeah, and the tank also needs to make sure that he moves the bus accordingly, because if he doesn't move the bus fast enough, then the Gatling gun will come out, and it might be exactly where the Boombats are shooting their missiles, and then everyone has to walk away, and the melees can't do damage while the Gatling gun is going on. So it's very crucial for the tank to move it accordingly, and now we are in the demission phase, where the bus is actually immune to damage. He does get this shield applied. Now a, a player will be targeted and has to run underneath one of those pillars to get rid of the shield. You have to hit three pillars to get rid of the whole shield, and we have the map spawn spawning as well. Right, these two uh, Sky Scorchers that you have to deal with will do significant tank damage. In addition to that, they'll focus one of the players, m draw a red line towards them, and in order to make sure that that player doesn't take full damage, the entire group will, well, not the entire group, but at least one more player will have to go in. On the si side of Team Poluka, we do see two more deaths once again during their trash skip, which means another 10 seconds on the board, and they haven't even pulled the boss yet while Method is at 35%. Yeah, now, uh, at this point, if they don't do anything wrong on Method U size, they should be able to pull this off. We see, uh, of, of course, both teams had their Bloodlust ready for this fight. And one thing to mention here as well is that they didn't actually manage, uh, they didn't have to get rid of all three pillars, because we probably had uh, a Monk statue or something there on the second pillar, which does weirdly count as a pillar getting hit. So instead of having, having to hit uh, three pillars, they only had to hit two. Yeah, there's, it's just a weird mechanic with the boss. Whenever someone's pet dies, it counts as one of the pillars. There's not really much you can do about it. But we do see them getting it down to 10%. They only have to deal with one or two more sets of mechanics. The nice thing about this fight as a healer that, that method you can deal with is the, ro the rocket always prefers ranged players. So if you only have a healer and three melee in the group, the rocket will always go on the healer. On Team Poluka's side, it could go on the elemental shaman. So they don't really know. They have to have two people move in and out the entire time instead of just one. And we do see the boss go down for Method EU. Pretty dominant, clean performance once again for Method EU. Very clean from them. And Ken here. Let's go into game two with Method EU versus Team Pualuka. Yeah, they almost immediately we're seeing pretty much the exact same pull we've seen from every team right out. They'll go down the left side, pull these first two packs together, give them about 12% mob count, and then they'll go to the boss after that. This is, I mean, we have to, we have to elaborate. This is a very dangerous pull to do, especially with just 
one range DPS being the Druid, since the uh, small Krullisks only charge the range DPS. So this healer is constantly getting interrupted, but we see them countering it out with the Tree of Life on the side of Method here. Yeah, so we see this Tree of Life again that we saw earlier, but it works really well in the temple because of those huge pulls that you do every approximately every three minutes. So you can do those big dervishes pulls at the end too and just pop this Tree of Life, make sure everyone stays alive on, on top of this grievous affix as well, of course. Now Team Faluka doing the same pull, of course we see the Munkin unfortunately uh, not having that much AOE damage compared to all those other specs that are available to them here. So I assume they used the Munkin here just to have the utility. Maybe they want to do some really crazy pulls later on where they have those this force of nature and the solar beam just to deal with it. Yeah, it's got to be for the CC. When, whenever you talk about Boomkins and Mythic Plus Dungeons, because they don't really have the AOE that they used to have, especially when we were doing the Legion MDI, um, really you're, you're bringing them just for their utility potential, like you said, the solar beam, the knockback. Also, really, really important are Treants. Treants help tanks out with doing bigger and bigger pulls, so I absolutely expect Team Palooka to come out with some massive pulls, use those Treants to make sure that the tank doesn't die to any tank damage, and then move on from there. Yeah, we see Team Palooka actually not using the Bloodas here, while Method E used it for this very first big pull. Now, that probably means that Team Palooka has a big pull uh, coming in later on, as you said, with this Moonkin, popping the Bloodas, maybe pull the whole room in, in the next boss room, maybe something like that. But now we see both of the teams engaging that first boss. Yeah, I didn't really see what Method EU did with her first Reaping Pack. I'm assuming they Shadow Melted it, because we see Team Palooka almost at the same time pulling it all into the boss. I don't really know if that's a, something you want to do on this boss. The rogue is gaining a lot of single target damage out of it, as probably is the moon king. Yeah, so we also see uh, they are b uh, behind in trash, so it's 22% versus 26%. But of course, uh, once they kill the trash, it should be even because we saw them doing uh, the equal pull, so they should be both uh, at the same level. Now we see, of course, on method EU size, they are they do manage to pull the mobs like to, to, to pull the two bosses a little bit closer to each other, even though there is a lightning shield. Now, unfortunately, on uh, Team Palooka's side, they can't do that because of this Moonkin. Uh, whenever he moonfires the boss, the other boss will get a moonfire too if he's in 20 yards range of the other boss. So they have to make sure they pull them further apart, which obviously does decrease your damage a little bit because you don't get this extra cleave. Right, like we've mentioned earlier on the cast, once again, these bosses do have a reflect shield that they swap off from time to time, so you can't evenly cleave them down. Otherwise, when you attack the lightning shield and mob, you'll take massive reflecting damage. So they, they kind of have to focus each one down. Now, the moon can, can off dot it. They're not going to kill themselves to off dotting it. It's just free extra dot damage, as well as the elemental shaman. But this is just like minimal things. These dots aren't crazy amounts of extra damage for them. Now we see, of course, Method EU uh, only 19% left on this last boss. And now this boss here, Aspect, doesn't do as much as the other boss, especially if the other boss already dead and not doing his passive abilities. So they are dragging the boss towards the exit of this room just to be faster and get this extra little bit of time to go through this. Yeah, and once again, they're pulling a pretty inconsequential trash pack three mobs into the boss, being efficient, making sure they're not just pulling three mobs by itself. Like you said, this boss doesn't do much when he's on its own. It's at 30%, so this is a very, very safe way to deal with this trash. We didn't see Method EU do this, although they do have this, th they probably will end up being the same trash percentage. Method EU just had a more efficient way of getting there. Yeah, now we see the shroud coming out of Method EU, skipping all this threat. Now, unfortunately, they pulled this, which I'm not sure was intentional, but one step came out, so maybe it was intentional, and they only wanted to have those two mobs that they needed for their percentage to pull on top of this other trash. Now, at the end, they will probably have to Shadow Mail to get rid of this last step mob that belongs to the group, but that shouldn't be a problem since they used both their shrouds instead of the Shadow Melt earlier to skip this pack, so d they do have their Shadow Melt available here. Yeah, it, it almost looked like the shroud ran out, and they were just kind of too slow and not at the front of the shroud, but we have seen other groups pull this trash, so it, there's a possibility that it isn't necessarily necessarily a bad thing, they might have meant to pull it on purpose. Now moving into the second boss room, we've talked about this trash so much, this trash is very dangerous, right? There's there's two main trash mobs to deal with, there's the Faithless Tendies, as he likes to call them, that he will heal themselves and once again they'll try to buff themselves by running to an egg and channeling drain on it. In addition to that, there's also the crazed incubators, which will blow themselves up as we just saw there when they get to 20%, and the last mob, that's the most dangerous mob of them all, is the Skilled Curlus Rider, which has a nasty frontal AoE. Now, one thing with this rider, when he reaches, uh, I believe it's 50% HP, he actually jumps off his uh, croc and he will beat, uh, 
he will be seeable when he's uh, at the start when you pull him he's not seeable so that's one thing to note especially when it comes into Palukas group which uh, I believe did have one death here because of this shaman probably not having the shadow melt but they did manage to get him back up and now they're coming to this room as well now with the force of nature as I said since the riders are not seeable they're also not tauntable by the force of nature which means you have to wait until they jump off yeah once again they're just having those same two guys die every time they do skips which you know, it, can't, it, can't, it has to be on purpose because it's happened three times now, right? But every single time they do it, it's 10 seconds off the clock plus the res timer. That's 15 to 17 seconds. In some of these dungeons, that's one trash pull. That's just, I mean, that's just too much. I, I don't really like this. If, 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 if having an elemental shaman is, is, is does this does this to your group? I mean, like, yeah. I, I don't really want to have an elemental shaman in my group. I do believe, so the warrior in Team Palooka's group is not actually playing Night Elf either. Uh, maybe their choice was, so if our shaman can't be uh, Night Elf, then our tank is just gonna, draw, gonna go dwarf too, just to have the, the better racial here, because we have one death anyway. Now, Team Palooka did save their bloodlust for this huge pull that they're doing in this room. Wow. Once again, the treants are probably being used here to make sure that the tank doesn't instantly die from all the trash mobs he has on him. We see the elemental shaman shooting to the top of the leaderboards, and is that a is that a balance through doing AOE damage? Yes, probably popped his incarn, so we can do damage once every three minutes. Huh. <laughs> now, I've been told that the balance druids just don't do AOE damage, but this guy's proving us all wrong. And as well, we also see the prot warrior doing a lot of damage too, and this is a super clean pull from them. No deaths so far. They've cleared the entire room out, which means they're going to be able to start the second boss the second they finish off the last of these tenders here. Yeah, they might actually make up some of their lost time here because this huge pull, of course, the uh, method EU has to do this in a little bit of small, uh, smaller pools compared to Team Palooka that are already on the bus here. They already dealt, they have still have some reaping mobs left, but they managed to kill everything so evenly that they got the reaping on top of the bus, even though they're 58%, so they're 18% over the reaping spawn. Now, very interesting pull from Method EU here. They man managed to pull one of the Nimbuses through the wall with the boss. Not really sure how you do that, but it's really impressive. That usually you'd skip those two mobs, so that's just free extra percentage of them. That's probably the 3% makeup between the two teams that will help them out in the long run. But we do see teams are actually neck and neck here on Marekta, both going into the first intermission at the exact same time. Yeah, so you can pull those Nimbus if you jump up on one of those axes and you get this perfect angle, then you can pull it through the skeleton. Now, if you have a Moonkin, a Moonkin has more range, can actually pull the Stormcaller and the Nimbus. Now, you probably don't want that because uh, it's extra percentage that you no don't need, but maybe they do have an extra route where you just choose to pull the Stormcaller and the Nimbus on top as well. So once again, going into Marathus mechanics here, Typically, it's a two, two intermission fight. In the first intermission, they have to deal with a few snakes. In the second intermission, they have to deal with a few snakes that also spawn LOS zones on the ground, which are really annoying, and you want to make sure you deal with them before the boss comes up. Because if the LOS zones are still on the ground when the boss comes up, there's a chance that you know one of your players gets stunned and you can't get them out of that stun. We see the Nada snakes on the side of Team Poluka there getting quickly stunned out by one of the rogues. Yeah, we see, of course, in the intermission phase, the, the boss jumps down and uh, curls around the room. If you get hit by the boss, you will get knocked back and you will get damaged. Now, it's probably not going to kill you on a 45 setting, but it's, you probably still shouldn't get hit by it because it reduces your damage that you do to the mobs, of course. Now, uh, when the boss comes up, he does have three different phases. And in the second phase, it's not so scary because he doesn't actually do the breath in this phase. So the positioning is not that important. The people don't have to be in front of the boss. They can stand wherever they want. But he also does uh, kind of a flash bang ability where everyone has to turn around else they get disoriented. Right, the blinding sand ability. Whenever you see yeah. that blinding sand go off, everyone needs to turn away from the boss and make sure they don't get disoriented. Also in this phase, once again, the knot of snakes ability where he'll target one random player. Stun them in place until the knot is either killed or CC'd out. You can CC it by stunning it, disorient, just about anything actually. And then the, the easiest thing to do is just have some one person pop one GCD, turn to it, stun it, and move on. Yeah, so in the last phase, this is the most difficult phase, of course, uh, of this boss because it, he combines all of the abilities together. Uh, if you take too long, you will actually spawn uh, the small snakes that we saw in the, in the mission phase coming out as well, which do uh, spawn those clouds that make you miss all of your abilities. So you need to be fast, but we see both of those teams manage to kill a boss without that happening. And we do see both teams using shrouds to skip past all of this trash here. Once again, that three pack or two pack for Method EU since they pulled it through the wall. This is super ineff inefficient to deal with. It's not, you don't want to be pulling two mobs. We do see Method EU going for the big pull. All of the Dervi, as we is call them. Is that what we call them it, now? It, that's Dervish. Pearl, okay, Dervi. Dervi. <laughs> They're pulling all of the Dervi together. Now, once again, this is a lot of damage, and we're probably going to see the Tree of Life. Yeah, we see the Tree of Life pop by Zelia to heal everyone through it. This is a lot of pulsing AoE damage. You can see their health bars moving around quickly. Once again, we see the other team pulling it slowly, playing it safe. If they can pull off this big pull on the left side, that'll give them a huge advantage. Definitely. And we saw both of the teams actually 
got to this very area of the room at the exact same time. So they were very, very even up to this point. But now with Method of you doing this big pull, and, and we see them pulling it off, actually. We see Ginger dropping really low, and just a whole dro a group dropping really low. But this Tree of Life is just a just big pull, and it carries this pull. And in fact, they didn't actually use their ballast either, because they were so fast that the ballast wasn't up. Yeah, and we have to see what they're going to use the second Bloodlust on. In, the pre in one of the previous Temple matches, we saw one team use Bloodlust on this boss, and we also saw one team use Bloodlust at the second phase of the final boss. It, it, it's definitely a preference thing. They might, they might not plan, plan on using it here since they did just pop the Tree of Life, but we'll have to see. Yeah, we see Team Paluka, of course, are doing, uh, pulling the same trash, but in two smaller pools. Now, that means they're a little bit slower, of course, while Method is already in the boss. They still have to deal with the last Derby, and they have to deal with the Reaving Wave as well. Now, uh, Method U, this, this boss we talked about earlier, um, uh, they popped their ballast too, by the way, on this boss. So this boss uh, is very difficult for a healer to deal with and for your whole team because you need to coordinate whoever soaks those pillars lightning. If it reaches the boss, he gains energy and you don't want that because if he reaches full energy, he will explode and do a lot of AoE damage to the group. So you need the players to soak them, but it does a lot of damage to whoever soaks them. And on top of grieving, uh, Grievous, that's just a lot for the healer to heal. Yeah, and that's raid wiping AoE. If the boss has 100 energy, you're pretty much wiping. It it's might not close. quite <laughs> kill them out in Fortified, but it's going to do a lot of damage to them, and since it is a Grievous Dungeon, the healer might not be able to come back from it, so it's very dangerous. Now, once again, you mentioned they have to be soaking these pillars, and it's pretty simple for this group because you have two rogues, both of which can cloak a rogue if the healer's behind on healing. In addition to that, like we mentioned on the third boss in the of last dungeon, the monk gets more damage from Karma. Also, look at the damage that this warrior tank is putting out on the side of Method E. That's impressive. That's actually crazy seeing all the damage coming out of Mo here. Uh, compared to the damage from Team Paluka. Now, of course, uh, the Moonkin actually does have quite good single target damage if you have uh, your incarnation ready every three minutes and you have your ballast. Uh, so it needs a little bit of ramp up time, but Moonkin for single target damage is actually not that bad as long as you don't get a really bad kill time. So on bosses, in theory, they shouldn't be too far behind compared to Method E. Right, and on top of that, we have to mention that Method EU did use their Bloodlust on this boss, like I mentioned earlier. Team Paluka does not have Bloodlust for this boss. They're probably going to plan on using it for one of the phases on the last boss later. So they are, they're just even more behind because of that. But they do have the advantage of having the Bloodlust up later. Now, coming in to the fun part of the dungeon, the puzzle part of the dungeon, they got to run through some sparks. they got to deal with the guy that makes the sparks. Then they got to get through the, uh, the skull room. Yeah, so of course none of the players is going to get hit by those lightning sparks, I hope, um, because else everyone is going to shame them in Twitch chat, of course. <laughs> and now they pull this uh, mini bus or this mini map here that uh, has to be dealt with. And then uh, we probably, s oh, we see actually Frag going through. He might go ahead and just sap and to see some of the uh, some of the mobs are ready so they're able to get the orbs and get them through to the, to the head. So once again, the, tip, the typical strategy here for, that most groups will use is their tank will go through the entire dungeon round everything up because if you're carrying one of the orbs and you get ta and you take any damage if you get meleeed by something you drop the orb which is just a time loss because you can't pick it up yourself again until your debuff is gone from dropping it we did see them not do that here though they, they just went right away now i'm not sure if they tried to do that because they had shroud if that was just a you know spur of the moment thing just see how far we can go but it definitely looks like it's a time loss for them here it does seem like it so they do have both orbs i believe over at the head they just choose not to put them in yet because of course as i said as I mentioned earlier, if you put in an orb uh, into the eye, then it will actually count as trash percentage, and they are on 78%, so as soon as they will put one in, it will actually trigger the reaping. So maybe they choose... Uh, I'm not exactly sure if they just want to kill this minibus that they skipped earlier, and then want to go ahead, or if something went wrong and they just have to go ahead and kill this. So something interesting to mention here is they use their second shroud to skip the spark channel which means that they don't have a shroud up here, I believe, to get through. So that's why they ended up killing all the trash. They need to save their melon to get all the way down to the boss room. It, it's, it's actually a really close timer. Their, their other shroud is probably either just coming off cooldown or within a minute, but you're not going to wait a minute for your shroud to come off cooldown. You're just going to go. Yeah, it's interesting to see what exactly they're doing. Maybe they have the same problem again as we saw in uh, Wakefrost Manor, that they're just too fast and they have to wait for something to come up for a shroud or something like that. Now, on the other side, Team Paluka is now at the same event. We see the tank doing the typical thing as we're used to seeing, uh, where he just runs through, picks up all the mobs, while probably uh, the one of the druids and the rogue are going uh, on, this, on the opposite sides, pulling up those uh, eyes and trying to get them to the head. Yeah, it looks like, I mean... 
It almost looks like the, the skull isn't open yet. They might have lost the second orb somehow. I do believe earlier when Frag had the orb on him, the mobs hit him, and I didn't see where the orb went. I assumed he was throwing it ahead, but maybe they actually meant they maybe they somehow lost one of the eyes and they're not able to continue here. That'd be pretty unfortunate. We just see them rounding up the rest of the trash in here, just probably trying to figure something out to do because honestly, if you can't move forward in the dungeon, there's not much a whole, a whole lot left to do. They did skip the spark channel. They could go back and do that for more trash percentage, but there's really not that much going on in this room once you've dealt with the trash bag. Yeah, if they won't manage to reach the last boss because of losing this eye and it's not coming back, then uh, they're going to be stuck here because they can probably somehow get 100% trash percentage, but they're not going to be able to kill the last boss. We do see Click going down on the side of Team Poluca in this trash in this skip once again, and they're fixing to pull this trash to start the next boss. On the floor, Jay. Coming back to it, guys, we did have a bit of an issue with the orb despawning in the Cephalus room here. So as the rules have been stated, we are only conducting remakes when the dungeon is not able to be completed. So we're going to reset the instance here because the orb does not respawn and just has been a despawn that has been pretty rare from it from happening in most cases. Uh, so at this point, I know the last time I actually saw it was something in early season one or just coming out of beta or something along those lines. So we're going to remake it, make sure that we get all the teams to reset, get everything that they need to be taken care of, and then we'll go right back into it. As we well, here we go again. I think, uh, I, I'm not sure if this team is cursed or something, but they seem to be getting a lot of remakes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so the thing I want to see from Method EU, obviously, they're clean. They know what they're doing in this yes. dungeon. They would have been fine had that not happened. Unfortunately, I mean, this kind of happened to them in the past, though, and we saw them tilt because of it. I want to see this team go through here with poise. I want to see them do it clean once again, prove that they are the number one team in this tournament, like yeah. they have the seed for. So they've been playing so cleanly. Uh, it's probably frustrating to them because of a bug happening. They don't, it's not their fault that it happened, right? So it's probably very frustrating for them. But as I said earlier, so Alia is uh, one addition to the team who has, like, a lot of experience in esports, even if it was a different game. But he might be able to keep everyone else cool and m make them calm down and to actually focus on just repeating the dungeon the same as they did before, do the same thing, stay cool, and you will win. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely having experience in other esports and other things similar to what we're doing right now will help you out in the long run. We do see them doing the exact same pull as expected. They proc their reaping, they pulled under the first pack here. That explains what they did last time since we didn't actually know and they're going to AOE that down before they get to the boss. Yeah, so busy Team Poluca also doing the same thing as they did before. Now, the one thing that might help Team Poluca here now would be pulling all the nearby on top of each other, just like Team Method U does, because up until that point, they were completely on the same level, right? Now, if you didn't practice this pull, it's probably too difficult for them to pull off, but it might be like a Hail Mary for them. If they have a person actually watching the stream and can tell them if they're ahead or behind, they might choose to actually try to pull this, uh, this off. Yeah, that's probably one of the biggest advantages to something like this happening. Like you, like you said, in, in competition play, generally speaking, you can have somebody watching the stream, albeit at a delay, to find out what the other team is doing, whether or not you're ahead or behind. And they could have seen that that was the pull that put them behind, and if they, if they know they need to do that to beat them in this dungeon, they might just make a Hail Mary play. They might go for it, just like you said. And if they pull it off, that could be the difference. Yeah, most definitely. So what I actually competed in our very first MDI 2017, and what we did, uh, because if you're competing, right, you probably don't have, don't have the time to watch a stream at the same time and to pay attention to what someone else is doing. But what we choose to do is have a sixth player be on our Discord channel and just watch us on the stream. And if something happened, we were behind or we were ahead, we would just ask him, hey, are we behind, are we ahead? What's happening? And he would give us the information. And that's something those teams might be doing as well. That's probably a lot more efficient than what my team did. I, I just watched <laughs> it. That was probably bad. <laughs> but we do see them getting down this first boss, Adderus and Aspects, pretty quickly. Once again, while both bosses are alive, there is an electrical shield, meaning they can't target one of the bosses with any of their abilities. Otherwise, they'll take massive reflective damage. However, they already do have Adderus down, and they're moving on to Aspects. Last time we did see Team Poluka pull another trash pack with Aspix when, when Adaris was dead. They'll probably do the same thing again to get that extra 4% trash mob. Clicking does go down, unfortunately. They're going to have to use their battle res instantly here. And that's just a battle res they don't have for the rest of the dungeon. And this team does tend to make these small mistakes throughout dungeons. Yeah, thankfully no one else died, though, because uh, if the tank goes down and the rest doesn't come out immediately, the bosses tend to just 
turn around, melee swing one of the, the, the melees and kill them immediately too. Now, of course, they only had one battle rest uh, for them, so thankfully they did manage to recover, get their tank back up. But as you said, they, those small mistakes, they will just, they will cost them at the end. Well, there's also a mental aspect, right, to not having your battle reses. You, you know that you don't have your battle res as a player. It means you might play a little safer than you otherwise would, which might cause you to make DPS rotation mistakes, which means you're killing things slowly, which means more mechanics get off, and just kind of snowballs from there. So it's, I mean, just having a mistake like that happen so early in the dungeon when they know they were already behind last time they were playing it, that's just, that's a mental blockade for them. Definitely. This is going to be a problem for Team Peluca. Uh, they are behind now a little bit as they were the last time around as well, because of course uh, they don't use their Bloodlust here, they use it for the bigger pool in uh, the second bus room, while Method EU is on uh, is on their way to the second boss room already. They did their first trash pull with the Raiders. And I do believe they did the same pull as last time, so it was not an accidental pull with the with the shroud. It definitely was on purpose, and they're probably gonna meld it at some point in here. They'll all pop meld at the same time, and they'll drop back with that mob, but not with the mobs they're in, they're in combat with. Exactly. Now we see Team Poluca managed to down the first boss. Now they're on their way to get this rider down, and then I believe they shrouded there as well. Or they actually had the, the death skip where we had the two people there, right? Right, so we're probably going to see the same thing out of them. I mean, they might use their Ankh there. It's just so inefficient. It's another 10-second loss. They also have to res the tank. I, I, I greatly prefer the way Method is doing it, shrouding past, making sure that they sl are slowly and methodically dealing with all the trash at the same time. Now, this is a lot more dangerous than it looks. This double rider pack, two frontal elites going off at the same time, lots of tank damage, also proccing Grievous on now. It's, just, it's really dangerous. Once they get to 50%, of course, it's not that bad. Yeah, a lot of times uh, what Method U is doing looks very easy, as I said before, and it looks so smooth. But all those pulls they're doing and all the dungeons are very difficult. And Method U just having a great showing here of performance. All the dungeons they've done so far, very clean uh, and pretty much very few to no mistakes coming out of them. Yeah, once again, like we mentioned, Klickna and Frusha going down on that skip. They get the res off, same as last time. And we're going to see them once again go for this entire pull with Bloodlust pulling the entire room. But now they're doing it without a battle res. Yeah, so without a battle res, of course, uh, it's just, as you said, it's just in your mind, right? You're doing this very big pull that is very risky, and now you don't have a battle res if something goes wrong. Now, uh, of course, the shaman could die because he is an ankh, but if anyone else dies, they're just going to have a full team wipe, and they don't have their shroud ready, so they have to, they need the rogue to release, they need the healers to release, and sell all the way back, which is going to cost them an insane amount of time, not only because they lose the time, but they lose their bloodlust, they use their cooldowns, and the mobs are still alive. So this pull is crucial for them. And it does look like they're getting everything down. Things are coming down to about 10-20%. Most of the dangerous mobs are going down. But it's not over yet. They have to finish the mobs off. These ending casts, these blasts that the, uh, that the incubators do at the end of their death, I mean, it, just one, one lapse of attention and your melee dies and you don't have a battle res so now you have to finish off the rest of the pull with two dps instead of three just m little m small things like that make the dungeon yeah, and at this point it's very important for them to actually uh, focus the the, ac the actual mobs and not focus the reaping mobs as we have the reaping already spawned so now they're trying to uh, single out the small mobs that are still alive with very little hp just so the boss spawns because you need to clean this whole room for the boss to spawn uh, so if you just go into reaping mobs and you ignore the, the living mobs with that slave their FHP, then it's just going to take much longer for the boss to spawn and you're going to be much more inefficient. And yeah, comparing, comparing them where they are now to where they were last dungeon, they were neck and neck going into the first intermission and the second intermission last dungeon to see Method EU going into the first intermission while Team Poluca is still about 20% behind. So it's definitely a huge variance this time. Yeah, so we see Team Method EU, of course, pulled this Nimbus again. Uh, over there on the skeleton, you just jump up on his egg and pull Nimbus through. We saw Sally actually dropping really low here. So he has to be careful to heal up this reaping, uh, this uh, Grievous fast, because the Grievous, of course, does uh, stack up to five stacks if you don't heal up. And on five stacks, it does more damage, and then it's going to be more difficult to get rid of it. And while he was healing himself out of Grievous, three more people got into Grievous range. We see now on a four stack. Mira is also on a four stack. So it's just kind of that mentality. Like, you know, Grievous is one of those lose more mechanics. When you're at four stacks, and you're already losing and you have to focus yourself, other people are also going to do Grievous. So that, that's, that's one of the dangers of the Grievous mechanic. Yeah, and then, of course, as a healer, you want to do as much damage as possible to help out your team to be faster, but this Grievous is just one of those annoying affixes for healers because, as you said, you need to handle it immediately. Even if a person only gets a little bit of damage, it's just going to apply this Grievous and you have to heal it away. If, if there's no Grievous and someone just drops to 80% HP, you can be like, okay, I'll 
just gonna passively heal it away. I'm just not, not gonna go out of cat form, continue doing damage. But uh, we see here Zelia, of course, needs to tap the people immediately. Yeah, and we do see Method E coming right out of the second intermission while Team Faluka is just going into it. So they still are slightly ahead. They're maintaining that lead. They're about 20% boss health ahead. And honestly, I mean, if they can pull off the same Dervi pull and Team Faluka doesn't go for it, I don't really see how Faluka comes back on this dungeon. Yeah, it's going to be very difficult for Team Faluka with this Zerra pull. Now, this pull, we talked about it earlier, is very difficult though. The, the dungeon is fortified, and this one pull with the Derva is the most difficult pull out of all dungeons when it comes to fortified and Grievous on top of that, because those Derva just do so much AoE damage, and they jump around on players. So, now, uh, that's something they can definitely fail on, and we have Team Faluka. This Maybe they try the save route as they did last time and just hope on Method EU not making this pull work out because then they, Team Paluka can actually be ahead. Zelia, we saw that. It's going to be clipped and it's going to be top on red. <laughs> Moving down to the large Dervite pull. This, this is the make or break point in this dungeon for Method EU. If they can pull this off and Puloka can't, it's huge. Now, once again, Zelia does have the tree of life ready for this, probably potting for it. It's, it, it's a lot of pre planning for this. And on top of that, they have three DPS classes that are incredibly tanky with their cloak, their reduced AOE damage taken, and as well as the karma from the monk. So I don't think they're too scared about this. The scariest thing is if a Nimbus gets an empowered charge off, that's probably, that in addition to the AOE pulsing damage is probably the most dangerous thing about this pull. Yeah, see Team Paluka not opting to do this big uh, Dervi pull. They do the exact same pull as they did last time. Now, as, as you said earlier, if Method EU does the same thing as they did last time, they do not make any mistakes, which we haven't really seen them do any big mistakes so far yet. So if they play cleanly as they did before, they keep their head cool, they, they keep their mindset on uh, this dungeon to do it uh, cleanly, then they're probably just going to be winning. Yeah, and once again, I mean, they pulled off the pull. They're using their lust on this boss. They're going to get this boss down a way before Team Faluka will. And as long as they pull off the gauntlet clean, make their skip to the last boss clean, the last boss is probably the easiest boss of the dungeon at this point. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, well, we see the, the, the last Reaping Souls here being killed by Method EU. And as you said, they do have the Bloodlust for the boss, meaning it's going to die so much faster. Now, I probably, I think that Team Faluka also has just less single target damage, even if... Uh, Elemental and Mukin are not that bad at single target damage. They just don't have the Bloodlust to pump up the incarnation damage and the Elemental Shaman damage. They're just missing it compared to Method EU. Just having this full single target, uh, this full uh, melee lineup. Uh, and of course, we saw now doing so much single target damage as well earlier. Now, the thing about having the Bloodlust for the last boss, it definitely greatly improves Team Poluka's pull on that boss because they do have multi dodgers. They have, they have classes that can dot multiple things, so they benefit more from the Bloodlust. Whereas on the side of Method EU, they just gain only single target damage instead of the multi-dot damage. So it's definitely like a, a comp related thing that's important. That's, there's a reason they did that. And on top of that, the timing is better for them to do the big AOE pull with Bloodlust. So it's definitely not necessarily a worse thing to do for them. It's just different. For sure. We see uh, Team Paluka now also pulling the boss. Now they are 50% HP behind on this boss. Now, um, it is 45, so it's actually not like a su it's not a super huge disadvantage. They're not they're not that far behind when it comes to time. But of course, they also have the three the, the three deaths from the skip earlier, which we mentioned because of the shaman who can't who doesn't have shadow melt and the warrior also not having shadow melt, uh, which costs cost them some time. They do have the bloodlust at the end and the multi daughters as you mentioned. So it will make up some time at the very end. Uh, and it might still be close because of that. We do see the danger, though, of Grievous on this boss. Everyone on the side of Method EU ha currently has multiple Grievous sacks, and Zelia's going to have to do something to get them out of this. I mean, we haven't had cheap proc on either of the rogues yet, but Zelia is super low. Everyone it's in the group no is super mana. low right now. It's the problem. He has, Zelia yeah, has no mana. No mana as well, but the boss is at 5%, so it's pretty much them versus the boss right now. All in, and it looks like they've got it down just fine. Okay, so it's going to be important here for... Okay, so they actually managed to have no one die, which is so good for them because as Ellie was completely oom and they all had the Grievous stacks, they immediately, as soon as they get out of combat, drop down the Fish Beast to get their HP back to heal the Grievous F because Celia had no means of healing that back up with CR mana. Now, if one of them would have died, it would have cost them a lot of time because Celia, of course, would have need to cast the rest or they would have they would need to release and come back and it takes them a lot of time. So, good on them for not losing any player here. It was very, very now, I did mention last time around their pathing here is a little weird. They used their second shroud to skip the spark channel, and they also had fragments go ahead and grab the first orb. Now, most people won't do that. Most people will wait for the tank to pull everything, but we see them do the, doing the exact same thing here. Maybe they know something people don't know here. 
Probably. I just hope that this time it's going to work out for them uh, compared to the last time. But as he said, Frag just picked up the RP, throws it ahead of him. Uh, he is stealth at the start, so when he stealths through, none of the mobs are going to aggro him. And we actually see Jinji uh, on his rogue go behind Frag. So maybe their plan is to have the tank pick up the right mobs and on the left side just have Jinji pick up the mobs so Frag can run through and do it at the same time instead of having the tank uh, pick up both of the sides, which takes longer, right? Yeah, I remember last time Fragments got hit by one of the mobs right as he threw the orb, and that's that's what caused... The, I think the orb got knocked out of his hands instead of him throwing it, and they made they made sure that didn't happen this time by making sure Jinji pulled aggro on everything first, so good on them. Moving down to the four hexer pull to, pro to proc the boss here. Yeah, we did see one death coming in from Team Poluka here. We saw the Moonkin dying. Not completely sure what he died, if he died to the um, lightning balls or if he got hit by something else. But we see Method E just uh, so far ahead at this point. They're already on the last trash mobs right before the last boss, while Team Poluka still has to kill the single mob that Method skipped. And then they have to do the, the gauntlet with the eyes, of course. That was a super impressive use of Shadow Moon, by the way. Going past all of all of the trash mobs in the gauntlet room, plus the trash mobs they have to skip to get this first boss, they did also use sap and disorients to get past. So, also really impressive use of just you know dungeon knowledge, knowing what their cooldowns were, knowing how they could get to the boss. Once these four hexers go down, they will spawn the final boss in the dungeon, of course, and they are going to pull it way before Team Poluka does. Yeah, so they do not have the bloodlust here for the last boss, and uh, as you mentioned earlier, multi dotting classes are generally better for this fight because you just have those four blood hexers that are pretty spread out. So if if you're a melee, of course, you're just going to single target one hexer. While uh, on the other hand, if you have multi dotters or ranged, they can put their dots on one hexer, uh, let their dots take, and just go on the other hexers in the meantime, meaning it's just much more efficient uh, damage on all four of them at the same time, while with melee, you pretty much only hit one at a time. Now, they're too, probably too far behind to catch up for, for this to happen, but their idea is probably to be faster in this boss. So this boss is not very not very similar to other bosses. Instead of DPSing the boss down, you need to heal the boss up. But in order to proc the ability to heal the boss, you need to make sure you kill all four Hoodoo Hexers in there. They still have one up here. Once you've done that, you'll click the orb and allow your healer to heal the boss. There are three phases. The first phase, which we see here, once you've healed the boss to 70%, you proc the second wave of adds. And then once you get to 100%, you proc the third wave of adds. But at that point, you get a massive damage and damage taken debuff. On the side of Team Poluka, we see almost everyone going down. However, the healer is still alive. So you can probably heal it. Reza. Um, yeah, I wasn't paying attention. I believe they did do a skip here, of, of course, uh, after doing the gauntlet. But we see all of them re releasing, so it was an unintentional uh, mistake that happened. That maybe the, the Shadow Mouse didn't work out properly, or they didn't get a Battle Rest out that they were supposed to get. But they have to backtrack all the way here. They have to kill the Reaping, because they triggered the Reaping when they pu put in the eyes. So now on the way back, they will have to kill the Reaping mobs, and they will have to just skip again. Yeah, they'll have to kill those Reaping mobs that they Shadow Mode the first time around. Once again, those Reaping mobs do have a larger than normal aggro radius, so even if you're 40, mo 40 yards from them, They'll see you and come right over to you and say, hey, what's up? So Method U, of course, uh, on the last boss still. They are, I believe, in the second phase here. They don't have their bloodlust, but uh, usually you don't need it as long as you play it cleanly. We have those uh, toes coming out, as you see, which are usually chasing the healer because the healer has healing aggro on them. Now, you want to get those toes away from the healer because if they reach the player, they will explode and put the disease on the healer that actually stacks and it will reduce the healing done that the healer is doing. So you definitely want to keep them away from the healer. In case uh, is one of them still goes through, we have uh, a Windwalker, of course, who can dispel the disease, so there's that. And we do see them going into the final healing phase of the fight where the healer will take the boss to 100%, and once reaching 100%, he will buff everyone in the, in the group with a large damage and damage taken debuff. We mentioned this before, once again, at this point in the fight, there's no fear of death at this point, it's just how fast can you DPS everything else down. Yeah, it's almost impossible to die here at this point. We see Salia going back, uh, pulling all this track that they're missing to get the 100%. They, of course, uh, try to not kill all the hexers first, because as soon as you kill the hexers, the boss fight is over, and it will immediately remove your buff. So you need to try to kill the trash first, uh, just try to kill three hexers, have only one hexer back up, leave the hexer alive until all the trash is dead, and then immediately afterwards kill the hexer so you don't have to deal with the reaping. Fortunately, the boss fight makes it pretty simple for you by leaving the hexers in place with their tank casts. But other than that, they're just going to move them. They're going to move the mobs around to each hexer, AOE them down. When they once they only have one hexer left, this is Zalia just kind of chipping it down a little bit so that once they finish off the AOE, they can just insta kill that mob. But like you said, this is just super clean from them. They're going to finish off that last hexer as they finish the rest of the trash and 
Very good done. They have zero deaths against very clean by method. I'm very impressed that they managed to do this dungeon two times in a row uh, without having any problems, any mentality problems. Just zero deaths very clean by method. An incredibly well composed method EU takes game number two here, taking it over Team Pua Luka.